Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire you to take action to be all you can be. We hear a lot about creativity and market disruption, but what happens when you disrupt a market to such an extent that big business in the market and its links to government and media strike back, threatening to take everything you've created? Today, my guest is former founder and general manager of ANREPS, Tony Wiles. Um, having spent eight years as a junior naval officer, uh, junior naval man, spending only two weeks actually at sea, Tony moved to WA in 1960 with his family. He lived in Port Hedland, then Perth, and also lived out in the hills. In his time, Tony has been manager and owner of a temp in bowling alley, nightclub owner in Northbridge, and horse trainer. Before, on divorce, Tony was forced to sell everything, including his house. At this point, when trying to sell his house by himself, it was at this point that Tony spotted an opportunity in the market and created Australian National Real Estate Private Sales, ANREPS. And this started a new and large chapter in Tony's life that we'll get into in this conversation. Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks, man, for having me. <laughs> That's Super. a big mouthful. That's a big mouthful. That's <laughs> oh, all right. That's good. So you came to Western Australia back in 1960. 1960. Yeah, after spending eight years. Eight years, eight and a half years in the Navy. Yeah. yeah. Um, what brought you to Western Australia? Oh, now this goes a long way. <laughs> this really does go a long way back. Okay. Um, at the end of the war, well, during the war, I was evacuated from London because I'm a Londoner. Yeah. And I was evacuated to Wales. My, both of my parents were in the army. My dad was away yeah. overseas. My mother was working uh, in the army in the UK. But uh, at the end of the war, we all got together again. In fact, I didn't even recognise who my father was when we met him off the train. Right. But we moved to Torquay, which is in uh, uh, south of England, in Devonshire. Yes. And my grandmother was also there. Yeah. And she looked after a laundry place where you take your clothes in and they get cleaned and you come back and you pick them up. And I happened to be in there one day. And this big bronze guy walked in. He must have been about 10 foot tall. So I was just a little fella. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I heard him talking to my grandmother and I looked up and I can remember this very clearly. I asked him where he was from and he said Australia. And if you like, a light bulb went on. And from that moment, I wanted to go to Australia. I could see this big bronze guy there. I thought, wow, I want to be like you. I want to be a big bronze guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where that's that's where the original where, seed of ideas started. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Superb. And then you went and joined the navy. Yep. For eight years, I virtually ran away when I was sixteen. And was, right. And um, in fact, I rode my bike from Torquay to Plymouth and joined the navy there. And then I was shipped out to. Um, a place in uh, Hampshire, and kitted out, and I was in the Navy. That was that? That was that. And I thought I was going to be an airman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that? Because they asked me what part of the uh, Navy I was interested in, and I saw this naval airman thinking I was going to be a pilot, so that's what I thought I signed up for. Right. Wasn't too bright in those days, right? <laughs> Super. So after the eight years, um, that seed of an idea with this bronze gentleman came back, and you thought, right, it's time. It's time to go and do something different and go Absolutely. to Australia. Absolutely. I'd already made up my mind to come here three years prior to uh, when I actually did. So this is nineteen what fifty seven. <clears throat> Excuse me, and. My mother and father said to me, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to sign on and, and do your full 21 years in the Navy? You know, what, what are you going to do, boy? Mm. So I said, well, as soon as I get out of this place, I'm gone to Australia. Right. So da Dad said, well, we'll see you there. Right. And a funny thing happened. Uh, I don't know if this is relevant, really, but they came. I was on um, a sea, Air Sea and Rescue Squadron in Malta at the time. And they let me know when the ship was passing Malta because on the way to the Suez Canal, on the way to – they were being shipped out on, on a boat coming to Australia. Yeah. And so I flew out to see them on this chopper. 
All right. Got the squadron commander to agree to take me out and wave to them on the ship as they went by. But didn't see too much of them because it was a very misty day. Yes. But I did see a bit. Right. Yeah. Superb. So you chose to come here. You, did you come as a £10 pong? £10 pong. On the boat. £20 in debt when I arrived. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And I understand you went straight to Port Hedland. That's right. What, what, what yeah. was the dis- idea behind Well, um, the three years my father was had been here, he decided to get off at um, Perth when the ship came through. They were originally going to go to Sydney, mm-hmm. but they tossed a coin, do they get off the boat now or do they keep on going to Sydney? They got off the boat <clears throat> and the they started moving up the country. And my dad was um, a mechanic, diesel mechanic and heavy engineering and all that sort of thing. And he got jobs and they had a caravan and a car, big old Buick, I think it was, or an Oldsmobile or something like that, until they got to Port Hedland. And he said, I rather like it here. So he stopped in Port Hedland. Right. And he started up a taxi company. So... When we met, or well, rather when I got off the boat in Freo, uh, my father was there to meet me, and we stayed in the cloisters that night. You remember the old cloisters? Well, you probably don't. No, no, I'm afraid <laughs> I don't. <laughs> the cloisters is, or was, it was still is actually the building on the, on the terrace, and it used to be like a hotel, sort of. Bed and breakfasty stuff. Mm-hmm. Had my first breakfast there the following day, <clears throat> and which was steak and bacon and sausage stuff I'd never eaten ever in my life for breakfast. Yeah, so that, so that was my first breakfast, and then we were Im- immediately on a plane, then straight up to Perth. Uh, sorry, to Port Hedland. Right Perth to, to Port Hedland. Yeah, and that was it for the next seven years. What were your initial thoughts when you arrived at Port Hedland? Well, it was nice and warm. <laughs> uh, well, it was in June, but so it wasn't really, really hot, but it was nice and warm, <clears throat> and it reminded me a lot of um, the weather was just like what is at the Mediterranean in Malta. Mm-hmm. So that's where I was stationed for two and a half years. So, yeah, I thought it was wonderful. And my mother said she knew I loved fishing, and in the first couple of days she said, why don't you go fishing? So she said, that the mackerel, she said, are this big? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Me thinking. Because I can remember when the mackerel in the UK were about that big. Right. And um, for those that can't see this, yeah. I'm measuring off with Yeah, the, yeah, we're talking about fingers. the difference between a foot and three foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I went down to the jetty and went fishing and caught my first mackerel with Ripped all the skin off my fingers. Right, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So, did, yeah. so did you go and work with your with them for yeah, your dad? Worked with dad. Got a job with dad, and um, in fact, I had three or four jobs to start with. All the guys. It's a pretty small town in those days. This was pre iron ore. Mm-hmm. There's a little story about that as well. I can tell you, but um, pre iron ore, beautiful place. Uh, Bogan Villa everywhere. Everything was bright coloured, a little bit desolate in other ways because it was out on, a, on an island virtually. It had a causeway running to it. The, uh, the people, though, were great. It was just like living in a small town. I think there were 350 people that included uh, the Aboriginals and so on. Right. So everybody knew everybody, and I thought it was heaven. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And so you worked on the taxi. So Yeah, so as I was saying... I had several jobs. The major one was working um, when the ships came in because that was the only way you got your food in the town. Mm-hmm. They did, it was all dirt roads to Port Head and anywhere north of Carnarvon was dirt roads mm-hmm. with nice deep corrugations and all the rest yes. of it. So the K ships, that's what they, they all had their names beginning with K, used to supply uh, the town's up to Darwin with food and whatever. 
And so all the guys were lumpers. We were all called lumpers in those days. I don't know what they call them now. Yeah. Wolfies or something. Stevedores. <laughs> <laughs> Stevedores. Yeah. And um, so we used to go down there and unload the ships for the town supply. So I became a wharfie. And there was obviously backloading when the ships went back down again. So I used to load up the ships that way. And I used to work for, um, who was it, Shell, I think it was up there at the time, mm. cleaning oil drums. In fact, anything that would make a quid. Anything that would make a quid. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty busy. Yeah. Pretty busy. Yeah. So what was the thinking process behind coming back down to Perth after being up in Port Hedland for, was um, it six, seven, eight years? Iron ore triggered the idea of moving out. Uh, and I can give you a quick idea about that, unless you yeah. want. Yeah. As a taxi driver there with my father, I actually took the business over from him and uh, was running it. But the Japanese um, uh, surveyors used to come out. So I used to take them out to Mount Goldsworthy, which was then just a hill. And used to try and drive up it until the car spun the wheels and started sliding back again. Yes. But we used to take them out there and they'd hop out <clears throat> with their little uh, packs and their little picks, gather up all the iron <clears> ore, <throat> put it in their little sacks and take it away for assaying and so on. That was quite exciting because, you know, you made a lot of money doing that sort of thing. But once um, Mount Goldsworthy started moving in with the heavy equipment into town, and then we realised there was a threat that they were going to move iron ore into town. We all got a little bit offy. Mm. And the town suddenly swelled from 300 to 3,000 or whatever. Right. A lot of people all around, and it's changed the whole complex. And then the first shipment came in, and the town virtually turned purple overnight. Just the dust was flying around everywhere. Mm. So that was it. I, I didn't like it then. Right. So I said, I'm off. <laughs> and I came to Perth. Right. Yeah. No prospects. But I thought, well, I'll try selling. So I learned how to sell. How did, how did you go about that? I joined a company. Well, I've, I picked up an ad in the newspaper, and it was called Caxton Print. You can guess what I'm was selling now, can't you? Yes. Yeah. Encyclopedias. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> but uh, you went to a little school of theirs and they taught you everything that you needed to know. You had to learn like about a 10-page script and then you were let loose on the population in Perth. And after a while, I suddenly realised it was a bit of a con. So I removed myself from there. But it gave me confident enough, or enough confidence to look for a job anywhere as a salesman. Because mm, of what you'd learned. For what I'd learned, yeah, exactly, yeah. So away I went. Away you went. Yeah. And then at some point you end up being the manager of a temp in bowling alley. Oh, yes. That's How another story that, in this. How story. did that come up? <laughs> <laughs> and then you, took, you bought it and took that over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, for whatever reason... Uh, I was out selling something or other, I can't remember what it was, but I wanted a coffee. I was thirsty at the time. And I saw the Rosemount Tempin Bowling Centre standing in front of me and I thought, oh, I'll just have a walk in there. It was sometime during the day. And I went in and I'm sitting down with the coffee and the guy that owned the place, uh, and I was chatting up the, the girl as well behind, <laughs> <laughs> behind the counter, and he came over and sort of joined in the conversation and he offered me a job right. of getting uh, orders for his laundromat. He had a laundromat underneath and downstairs on the main road. And the idea was to go around to hospitals and ask them for the, get all the laundry done, the sheets and all those sort of things. So I said, yes, I'll do that. So I did that for about three weeks and I was going pretty well. And he said, look, I, how about being the manager of my bowling centre? And I said, well, I know bugger all about bowling. I can't even bowl. Yeah. And um, he said, that doesn't matter. Nobody knows that. You'll be able to teach 
anybody who comes in, he said, they don't know you can't bowl. You just have a look at the books and tell them what to do. So that's what I did. So that started off me in the bowling centre. Yes. And uh, I did pretty well. And I said to him, would you like to lease it to me? And he agreed to that. And then I said, I'd like to buy it off you. That's how it happened. Excellent. So during this time, it, it sounds like you're sort of, if you know what I'm saying, rolling from one job to another and, and just letting life unfold in front of you. Absolutely. Is, is that what was happening? My life was an accident all the way through. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, you know, nowadays people get so hung up in, this is my career and this is what I want to do and it's very focused and what have you. Yet listening to you here, um, you know, it just seems to be unfolding in front of you. It's, it did. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Indeed. So can you tell us more about between the sort of the bowling alley and when you started and reps and, and I understand that there's, you know, there's time with horses in the middle of that. Yeah. You give way. us a potted history from one <laughs> to another. <laughs> well, that was another accident, of course. Yeah. Uh, actually, I married the girl I was chatting up in the bowling alley. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, a friend of hers said, why don't you two guys come horse riding with us one day? <clears throat> so I'd never been on a horse. So I agreed. And off we went. And we went somewhere in Cavisham. And we got on these, I call them nags nowadays, but didn't know any better then. And we went for the ride. And I said to my wife, that was pretty good. I quite enjoyed that. But the horses looked a bit rough, didn't they? So she said, I said, how about we get a couple? So she said, yes, all right. I'm as innocent as anybody else was in those days when it comes to horses. I, I didn't know one horse from another. So we bought a couple of horses and I leased a paddock in Hazelmere. And these two horses happened to be ex-trotters. Now, to anybody who's listening and they know anything about trotters, you can't stop the little devils once they get going. Right. And so we had a couple of accidents with those. And then more experienced people said, you know, get yourself a thoroughbred or something like that. So I looked around and I went to a horse trainer who was selling this horse, which had got a bowed tendon. It had been brought especially to Perth to win the Railway Cup. But in the meantime, it had bowed a tendon. Right. And so it was for sale. And so I said, I'll buy it. Lovely black horse. So I bought this horse. And I said, what do I do? He told me all about the bow tendon. And so I said, well, what do I, what do I have to do, and, you know, just to look after it? And so I fed it on peaches and cream for the next six or eight months or whatever it was. <laughs> and we rode it very gently around the paddock and that sort of thing. And this guy phoned me up, this ex, well, he, was not, he wasn't an ex-trainer, he was a, still a trainer. They said, how's old Kennedy going? That was the name of the horse, Kennedy. And I said, oh, he's fine. And he said, can I come and have a look at him? So he came and had a look and said, gee, you could race this horse again, you know. So I said, all right, what do we do? So he said, well, and he mapped out a, a program for him, trod him in deep sand and all the rest of it. Just light work. So I did that for the next three months. And he came and had a look. He said, give him to me for three weeks and we'll race him. And he's going to win. Now, this horse had been out of racing then for, what, 18 months? Mm -hmm. Quite a long time. So I gave him the horse and he decided to race him at York. He says, out of the way, nobody will remember Kennedy and we'll get a big price and you'll make lots of money. So I thought, oh, this sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, cut a long story short, the horse raced. He won in a photo and um, a protest. And I came out of there with lots and lots of money. Trust me, lots and lots of money. I, and what I didn't know, I was betting with the biggest bookmaker in Perth in those days. He eventually, I won't name him because he eventually became uh, one of the city councillors and so on. Anyway, um, 
and I became firm friends with him. But he kept saying, I used to get, I was going back to him when I was betting. And he said to me eventually, how much, much, how much more money have you got to put on this horse? And I was, he said, I'll take the lot. So I pulled it all out. And well, I had five grand on him, let's be honest. Yeah. And 12 to one. Right. <laughs> so, and I've never made much, so much money so quickly in all my life. <clears throat> so I said, well, how long has this been going on? I've got to get some more horses and so on. And that's how it developed. Bought a property up in the hills. I turned it into a, a racing establishment, built all, all my own stuff there and a working track and eventually got a licence. I had 21 horses in work at one stage up there and bought shares and stallions and put mares to them and bred the horses and actually raced them. And all the rest of so that's what happened. Yes. Yeah. How did, how did that come to a... Oh, how did it come to an end? Yes. Yeah. Uh, two people, two or three people brought it to an end in one way or another. Uh, everybody's heard of Connolly, of course. <clears throat> he's been, you know, he's no longer with us. Mm. Uh, there was a couple of other big names who were touching horses up, doping them. There was one very well-known one, which was Rocket Racer, which won the Perth Cup. Right. And still kept going after winning and could have won it <laughs> second time round. <laughs> <laughs> but um, also a lot more money was being put in and a lot of better class horses were coming in to the WA. Right. And food, you know, horse food prices leapt up. And I suddenly thought to myself, hmm, because really and truly, when you're a battler, because that's what I was, having a lot of fun, nearly breaking even most of the time, uh, I thought it's time to get out. But I had one one in the bag left. I had one horse which I called Muscles, uh, mainly because when the mare dropped him, she wouldn't stay with him and he chased her all over the paddocks all the time. Right. And he built himself up into a real nuggety little horse and he had a bit of bad luck as a two-year-old and as a three-year-old, uh, not racing. He was just always getting into trouble. Finally got him into a maiden, and then he won me uh, three in a row at 40 to one. Nice. Ending up in the city, winning in the city. So I started him in the country, got into the city, and that was enough money then for me to get out of the game. And So right. thank you very much. So I thought it was time to move on. In the meantime, of course, I've bought uh, women's boutiques and coffee shops, and so I was sort of building up that side as well at the time. Right. Yeah. Awesome. All by accident. All by accident. I'm just amazed at this this entrepreneurial journey that seems to have twists and tails, and it's all just unfolding in front of you. Mm. So how did we how did we get to Anreps? Um. Well, it was selling that property actually up in the hills. That's what started it. Mm. Uh, the local agent up there uh, wasn't particularly interested or he was busy. I don't know, whichever. But he said to me, well, I'll send people around. You show them your property. He said, no, I'll <clears> deal with the rest of it. And that was really what happened. I was showing people all over the property thought I was doing a lot more than probably that I was, but I thought I was doing plenty. And he did do the paperwork and eventually the property was sold and I, I kept half it and subdivided that as well. 20 acres up there. So I uh, split with my wife. That was not a good time really. I bought a property down in Perth hmm. and... All of a sudden, I didn't like it there where we bought. It was in Bull Creek. And I could hear my neighbour going to the toilet in the middle of the night. Well, after you've lived in the middle of 20 acres, you know, it was a bit of a shock. Yes. <laughs> so I decided to move again. And I thought, well, I sold my last property. I'm thinking to myself, I sold my last property. And reality is I did all the showing and that, but I didn't do the paperwork and stuff. So I put it on the market myself as a private seller. I didn't know a thing about it. 
And whilst I'm doing this, I had lots of agents come around trying to get the job from me. And now you've met the lady Dorothy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She also knocked on my door. Right. <laughs> and I said, go away. But I thought, well, you're rather nice. But she persisted. And then she started telling me, look, you're not doing these sort of things. You're not doing other things. And the people that you think are going to buy are not, because I'd, I said, I think I've got a buyer anyway. But she'd already met that person and told her they weren't going to buy it. So I said, well, you're so bloody clever. Let's see you sell it then. And she did within a couple of weeks. Right. And I'm thinking about this afterwards. And I said to myself, well, well, let me have a look in the newspaper. So I looked in the newspaper and there were about 200 people trying to sell their property in the newspaper themselves, prior to sales. So I thought, well, these people would probably like myself know nothing about what's going on. So then I got in touch with Dorothy, who'd sold my house, and said, look, did you know this is going on? And she said, yes. So I said, well, you're a school teacher. You know how to teach people. How about we get together? I'll tell you what I don't know and what I thought I should know and all the rest of it. So she agreed, and we put together a program, and that's how Enrips was born. We thought we would saw the market of all these poor people out there didn't know what they were doing. Yes. And thought, well, we can help. And so and so we're clear, this is so instead of enlisting the help of a real estate agent and the fees and everything that comes attached with that, mm. which um, I imagine you first became aggrieved at when you sold your farm property, and mm. um, this is somebody actually going through the process and selling the property themselves and, and empowering themselves in this Absolutely. transaction. And and not necessarily paying the fees. That's right. Yeah. Seems seems like a great idea. Yeah. There's still fees. To, there are bits and pieces yes. you have to pay. Yes. But um, a fraction of what it would cost. And I thought, well, there would be enough there with all of these people trying to do it if they all use my system for us to make a reasonable profit out of it. Mm. But more importantly, we'd be empowering, as you said, all of these people, and they would know exactly how to do it. Yes. So that's how it all started. We sat down and for a whole year we followed what people did in the newspapers and we found out how many actually did sell, how many went to real estate agents, how long it took. Most of them we found around about 90% of the end uh, signed up with a real estate agent. Right. Which gave us, we, we realised then that these people just didn't know what they were doing. So we knew exactly what it was all about. And that's when we put it all together. So you put it together into a package yep. that you could sell, obviously, at a much lesser rate, but then it, it, it stepped people through the process. Yep. Is that right? Yep. And, and then drew in the relevant forms and what have you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did you then go about getting that out there? Yeah, well, I mean, first we covered our backsides. Um, we put all of our packets together. We went mm. to Consumer Affairs and said, this is what we plan to do. And they said, well, go on, get on with it. Anybody can do that. They weren't particularly interested. Yeah. So. And didn't you also speak to Rewa to say. Yeah, we asked if we could use their forms. Which were publicly you know, available. Their, their um, contracts and so on. They didn't really mind. They said anybody can buy those. So we bought them. So they were all included in what we actually did. So it was a mixture of using stuff that we knew, stuff that was available anyway, and we just put the package together. And then came the big moment when we tried to sell it. And what was the uptake like? <laughs> for four months, nothing happened. Right. <laughs> it resounding <laughs> quiet from the market. <laughs> you got to remember this was back in the late 80s. Yeah. And... So, I mean, we had um, for sale signs made up with our name. We planned a logo. We did all of these things, and I actually even designed the uh, post that there was going to hang on it so that the sign it swung gently in the breeze and all of that sort of business. And I put the signs in the back of my car, looked up all the private sellers, 
on the, on the weekend and was driving around from one to the other. And anybody that didn't have a sign on their front yard, I knocked on their door and said, I see you're selling your house privately. Would you like one of these for sale signs? In fact, we've got a complete package which you might be interested in. All my salesmanship was coming out. So. Yes, all the stuff you'd learned from the encyclopedias. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very good, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and I did that for nearly four months. And what most people were saying, well, it's a great idea. How many people are doing this? And I had to tell them, you know, you're going to be the first. So it didn't really work. And then all of a sudden, it did work. What, what was the tipping point for that? It was probably, well, Doroth and I were both going and listening to each other when we were making a little presentation about what we do and how we go about it. And we used to come out of there, get in the car and argue the hell out of each other. You should have said this and you should have said that and all of those sort of things. And I think You guys are in a relationship at this point. Oh, terrific. Properly. <laughs> it's, it's still like that. Yeah. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, that's okay. And... Um, so between us, we really got to the nitty gritty and we put together a great presentation so that when you said it and told people exactly how it worked, they had a much better understanding than my first initial try at this mm. sort of thing. And away we went. And then. So it's about really making sure your, your, your pitch was crystal clear. Crystal clear, yeah. And they understood the proposition really well. And what happened? We were doing this from home. And we had a little sunroom. Uh, we weren't computer illiterate. We were computer illiterate. Everything was done by hand. But people started coming to the front door, knocking on the door, wanting to buy what we had. And after a little while, we said, well, we'd better get an office or something because it started getting noticeable. All these people lining up. Yeah. <laughs> people wonder what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we... Um, well, we took over an office or a corner butcher shop on, in Manning and here in Coma. And it was loaded with asbestos and all that sort of thing. Completely oblivious and ignorant to the dangers of asbestos. I just ripped the place apart and we refitted it out. And that became our office right on the corner there. Yeah. And we were doing quite well. You know, I'm talking about getting customers. And so the money's starting to come in now. Yeah, that's right. And we were sort of making a living, which was quite good. Well, from our point of view, you go from lollies to uh, you know, big ice creams and things like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but when people started to take notice, so did other people. And I'm talking now about the industry. Yes. But more importantly, what really happened to us is Channel 7, uh, I'm just trying to think who the reporter was now, I can't recall, but they came and said, we'd like to do a, uh, a little segment on you. And so we said, okay. They said, we're also going to do one with Reba and so that we get both sides of the story, what's going on because we were running little ads in newspapers by now and uh, the local newspapers, and it was like Charlie did this and John did that and Sandra did the other, and they all saved whatever money it was they were saving. And it was a very successful way of advertising. Yes. And because there were only a little two square inches of ads. And it was amazing the number of people who picked up on it, and so did the TV uh, companies. So they did this uh, segment on us. And they said, uh, we'll let you know when it's going to run. And I said, please let us have a look at it before you do it, because by then we were getting a little bit leery about uh, the industry itself. Hmm. We'd had death threats. Oh, right. We'd had rocks through the window. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when, when did that start? Oh, about six months after we'd gone into the offices here, maybe a little bit later. Than right, that. so this is where it's really it's picking yeah. up. Things are picking up, yes. And the market's reacting. Yes. And um, well, they actual ran this. Sorry, Tony, actual death threats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, on the phone, on in the, the letter? Phone. Or? On the phone, yeah. So um, they ran the TV show. We didn't know when it was going to be played. We had no idea. 
that around about four or half past four in the afternoon, by then we had a, a couple of other staff and the phones started ringing, all the phones, and they were from all over Australia, from Cairns and Brisbane and New South Wales, all over. And apparently they'd run this show on the Mike Willisie show, that's right, the Mike Willisie show. And it's like a, a slot in the evening over there, but it was here, it was still daytime, of course. Yes. And they'd run it over there, and all these people were phoning us about the how we did it and what we were doing and could they do it in their state and all the rest of it. And that really put us on the map. In fact, it exploded after that. Right. We had people flying over wanting to take franchises. And so we did eventually franchise right across Australia. Right. But that's when the real trouble started. So what's the real trouble? <laughs> well, well, the real trouble is the, the industry where well, you had – we were here, and then you had the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, uh, Queensland, and South Australia, all going bananas about it, and colluding together. And I can say this because we've got it all on paper. Yes. Um, but they were colluding together on how they could put us out of business because we were running at that stage something like 600 properties in Perth alone. Mm -hmm. Um just helping them to sell themselves. Yeah. And so the whole industry got going and then they started complaining to consumer affairs. This is the industry was complaining that we were putting ourselves out to be real estate agents. We had lots of things that probably made us look a bit like real estate agents, but we made it very clear that we weren't. Mm. We distanced ourselves as far as we could every time. We had the opportunity to do that. But when we had photos in the window, so... You look like real estate agents. Yes. That was the conclusion they were trying to draw. Mm. But all of these complaints, of course, uh, Consumer Affairs said that they had to investigate. And over the years, I'm going over several years now, there were three complaints made about us. We don't know who they were. Nobody ever disclosed who they were. There was never a uh, consumer complaint made to our, us personally. All we had was recommendations. All right. But the real estate industry itself was complaining to consumer affairs. They said they had to investigate. So we had all sorts of stuff going on. And it was always in the newspapers. And it just went on and on and on how, for six how, years. How, how did you get through that? What were the stories you were telling yourself during that? Because here's a guy who's, who's spotted a gap in the market. Mm put it together, empowering everyday people. It's a very Australian type story. And then, boom, you're getting all this backlash. But from what I understand, you know, you can, you're having you, different places around the country. They're putting in adverts saying that this is illegal and this is wrong and it's too risky. I understand that you've got um, actual real estate um, agents coming into house openings telling everybody, that, oh, this is illegal, we shouldn't be doing this, et cetera, et cetera, you know, as if we're in prohibition times or something like that, you know. So you're continually getting this onslaught. What, what, what are the stories that what, what you're telling yourself? Well, I always woke up thinking today's going to be better than yesterday. Right. <laughs> as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was. It was very wearing. I mean, we were flying from state to state. Our franchisees were getting told that they were going to lose everything they've ever had in their lives, that they were going to be sued, uh, the property was going to be taken away from them, all sorts of things. And we made sure, actually, that none of our franchisees ever suffered. And there was one that put his foot down with us, there's a guy in South Australia, um, and he said, well, I don't care, I'm with you. We'd already engaged um, legal opinions. Malcolm McCusker in particular was the one that we had for us, well-known name. And we felt confident that we were okay. I've got to be honest, I wish I'd stuck my finger up at them at the very beginning. What would, what would sticking your finger up look like? 
Oh, actually, physically. <laughs> yeah, for the guests at home, I've just had a good look at Tony's with the finger. Um, <laughs> no, but how would you have physically done that? Would you have just... Challenge them. Challenge them. It, it, well, really, do something about it or shut up. Yeah. Um, Proactively. Yeah, we, we, we were always putting out the bushfires. We weren't starting them. Mm. You know, we sort of kept our head down and said, well, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and try and disregard it. But it never stopped. It just never stopped. Mm. I mean, we had dawn raids. Dawn raids? Yeah, oh, yeah. There was, um, we were asked to change our signage and our logos. We had two people there shaking hands. That was all. And the thought behind was that we're bringing two people together in the way that we work. Yeah. Uh, they didn't see it that way. This is the um, uh, Consumer Affairs. Whenever we see them or saw them, we, when we went to see them, there was always a battery of lawyers there. There were eight or ten people around tables. We went around there just to have a chat. Uh, I have to say that the inspectors who came to see us were always very fair-minded, hmm. were always very fair-minded. In fact, they always gave us a clean bill of health. And I think the whole idea was to intimidate us with whatever because... Intimidate, the, bog you down. That's right. Take yeah. you away from doing what caught part of the All business. All those sort of things, yeah. So what was, what was I saying? <laughs> My mind is going was, back in yeah, over those years. Yeah, you know? I was asking you, you know, how you got yourself through that. What yeah, were the things yeah. you were saying to yeah. yourself? What was the story? It, well, it was difficult. It was difficult, expensive, and you run a bit close to things at, at the time. I mean... It broke, well, it literally made us go broke. That was the intention uh, because you spend so much money doing these things. I mean, we lobbied the government here. We lobbied them in each state. We lobbied the federal government. We went everywhere we could just to try and get it stopped or sorted one way or the other. Hmm. But it didn't work until the very end. Did you ever think of giving up? No. No. Why was that? I like to finish what I'm doing. <laughs> nice big fight. I'll, I'll, I'll give up when I'm ready, not when somebody else is ready. I like that. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, I suppose on one level, you must have thought you were onto something. Uh, you must have thought you were onto something as soon as this started. Oh, we did. Look, our system spread to Tasmania. New Zealand. I think they still do it in New Zealand. We had a couple of New Zealanders come into this office here. And they bought everything that we did. And they said, oh, they're just going to try and sell their homes in New Zealand. But we soon found out that, that what they did, they set up a whole new system over there, identical to ours. Yeah. In fact, we had people copying our stuff here. Um, what, within Western Australia? It, well, yes, within Western Australia. Yeah. And they photocopied everything that we did and all yeah. their documentation and put their name on it and went into business here. Yeah. Brilliant. So you're getting cannibalism within your small, within your sector as yeah. well as having the other side of the market. That's right. Having yeah, to go yeah. But um, most of the others dropped off at some stage or another anyway. Those who, that we didn't try and put out of business, they dropped off because the, the fear of losing everything, the newspapers' reports were always going to take us to court. They were always going to do this or the other thing. And I think the fear that was put into our other franchisees as well, was enough to make people who are interested in the business, mm. running a business like this, to get out of it and wait to see what happened. Mm. Uh, were we going to win or were we going to lose sort of thing? Indeed. Yeah. So what was the turning point of when this subsided? Well, finally, there was a letter which... Uh, well, it was read out. It was, well, it was a, like a statement read out in Parliament. Is that state or federal? State. Yeah. And it defined what we did and how we went about it and what we could do and what we couldn't do, which is exactly what we were doing anyway. Yeah. As um, legal. And that was really the end of it from that moment, or well, supposed to be. Uh, like the industry could no longer publicly attack us. 
I mean, we used to be named and everything else, which meant they couldn't do that any longer. So they just referred to it then after then as private cellars. Yes. So they still kept, you know, muddying the waters whenever they could. Still do it today. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, would you? No. <laughs> but they do, yeah. No. What brought about that statement in Parliament? Well, I think at it the end been... they just realised they that what we were doing was legal. Hmm. And so emotionally. They, they just couldn't take us to court. Um, there were many opinions. There were opinions given to us which the real estate industry got, which um, consumer affairs got. There were whistleblowers. There's always whistleblowers. And they sort of kept us informed in many ways about what was happening. And I think that gives you a little bit of heart because you could tell, well, you couldn't tell with the real ones, they were determined to go ahead through their lawyers. Mm. And we've got all of those papers. I was reading them last night, as a matter of fact. Oh, right. <laughs> but uh, and their opinions. But um, no, they were never going to do anything to us because we were doing nothing wrong. Yeah. It was just an evolution, if you like, of what happens. Hmm. Like, it wasn't so long ago when, um, well, there wasn't a computer, so there was no laws about it. And what we were doing, there were no real laws about it. Yeah. And so when the public opinion comes down on your side, well, they change the law. And, and now what they virtually did was change what they, what we could, what people could do and couldn't do and say so that that was never going to be prosecuted or investigated. Right. And that's what we got. There you go. And after that, you've got a proliferation now of all sorts of people doing it. Right. Yeah. And how, how did you make the transition to the internet age? Great difficulty. Great. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> well, neither of us were that way inclined. <clears throat> um, I can remember when we bought our first uh, computer, we had to get somebody to explain what this little thing was running across the screen, the cursor. Yeah. We didn't know what it was and didn't know how it worked and what you should do and all the rest of it. But eventually, of course, we made that conversion. And it didn't take me long to realise the value of the internet. And ha in fact, we became one of the first to have a real estate uh, website. Right. And it was primitive, but nevertheless, it was it was there. And of course, we went on from there. I've become a big fan of it. I'm not very clever on a computer myself with my fingers. Right. But I've got lots of ideas of what you can do with it. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And then, so Anorex continued up until very recently. Very recently, yeah. The, we, you know, retirement has been looming now for many years, but people still kept coming and looking for help and assistance. And a lot of our old clients say, you don't want to sort of leave them. And we also had quite a few people who were interested in running the business. Um, I know I'm sounding a bit pompous about this, but they didn't sort of measure up to me. Right. <laughs> uh, our intention is to help people, not to make money. Yes. Making the money was a byproduct virtually. And whether we made it or whether we didn't, it didn't matter. It was really helping. Mm. And the people that seem to be interested want to know how much money they're going to make. Right. Instead of asking me how many people can I help, I might have been more interested in mm. putting the business to, to them, you know. Yeah. It's, one, it's one of the things that strikes me about the story is that um, it's not cash-driven. Um, yes, you developed a business. Yes, it's been successful. But there almost seems to be this, um, almost like this mission to, like I said earlier on, empower people to make their own choices, mm. see their own alternatives, and go forwards with that. Yeah, that's what it's always about. Because I didn't know to do it how properly myself in the first place. Yeah. And all of a sudden I found out, I would say, 
very few people know as much about private sellers as we do today. Mm. Their psyches, the things they want to know, the things they don't care about and how to go about the business. I think we know it all. We've heard every story of the rich. I imagine so. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah. So did you find someone to hand down reps over to? No. No? No. So we you... virtually closed the doors on it. So you closed the door on your terms? Yes. And now I'm sitting at home wondering. <laughs> <laughs> wondering what to do. <laughs> well, it's surprising. When you've got nothing to do... You think, what the hell am I going to do today? This, this, um, I think when you've been working for so long, you're sort of driven inside. Mm-hmm. There must be something. There must be something. And, of course, it's slipped back into real estate, I suppose, because for 25 years that's all you've thought about. Mm. So you've slipped back into it. And slipped back into it a little bit in my head. In your head. And now I think I've sorted it all out. And what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> What's that you've sorted? The, the ultimate sale, the ultimate way to sell real, real estate. Right. Look, I've got nothing against real estate agents. Yes. But they're not required. The ultimate way. Yes. Yeah. The ultimate way so I'm sort of working on that idea now. There are two or three other people of similar minds. And the idea is to make it free. Right. To make everything that you've done with Unreps completely free and out there. Completely free. and um, That is an enormous so, disruption. Oh, yeah. I mean, what you've done to start with. It makes is, websites obsolete, virtually. How does it make websites obsolete? Well, that'd be giving the game away. <laughs> right, okay. Watch this face. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you privately. You okay. Like. <laughs> but to, um, yeah. Uh, I'd be fascinated that, given today's prevalence of websites in, as a selling tool, mm. to do away with a website is, it would be something quite yeah. new and novel. But, uh, yeah. So that's what I'm working on today. That's what you're working on today. Mm. So coming out of the story and going into yourself, what does what does success look like for you over the next five or ten years? Real success would be able to retire. <laughs> You've had one go at it, Tony. What would the next one look at it like? No, I'd like to finish off the job that I started. Really finish it. Because times do move. We, when we started, there was no such thing as computers virtually. Mm. And databases as we know them. And we've moved from there to today. And now... There's one more step to go that I could do in my lifetime. Mm. Yeah. And that would be success. That would be success. The ultimate, yeah. That's giving a huge amount back. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, what's, what, was, what was one of your best days with Unwraps? Oh, with Unwraps? Yeah. Or in life, actually. Let's go out of Unwraps into life. Well, I've had a lot. Yeah. No, I really do mean that. I've had a lot. I've been so lucky. Uh, I think probably the most exciting, so it would have to come within the best, was when Kennedy won his first race. The, that horse won its race, yeah. Yeah. There's, they call it the sport of kings, and if you ever own a horse and put your life into it, as we did, sort of, uh, and then when it races, that it's not just the horse that's racing. Yeah. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> You're inside that horse. You really are. And your heart is pounding. Even if it loses, your heart is still pounding and you're, you're urging, you're doing everything within yourself to, to get it over the line. But I think when that happened... I thought, how good is this? Excellent. That was one of the biggest moments, I think. I can imagine. Mm. What's been one of your darkest days? Probably when my 
parents died, and I didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye. Right. What, why was that? It was sudden, didn't know. Right. I mean, uh, my mother was in hospital at the time, um, and f- she was only supposed to be in there for two days, and she ended up in Charlie Gardner's in intensive care. I went to see her one day and said, I'll come and pick you up tomorrow. And tomorrow she was in intensive care and died. Right. So that was a big shock. And then another time was then my father was on his own and he had a heart attack and I wasn't, I'd seen him the week before, three or four days before. But then he died and nobody knew for about three days after he was dead. So those are the darkest days, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If you could um, go back and give Tony, who's just left the Navy and he's on his way to Australia, a piece of advice from where you are now, what, what would you say to him on his way over to Australia? Do whatever you want to do when you get the chance. Why's that? Because looking back, there are plenty of things um, that I've wanted to do. Since I'm talking about, since I've been in this game in, in real estate, which I gave up for what I thought was probably better for everybody else. And so I didn't do them. Right. Up until then, I really did whatever I wanted to do. <clears throat> but in this game, I became so bogged down in it yeah. that I didn't do what my mind or heart wanted to do. One of the biggest ones is retire and go around Australia okay. for two or three years. And now I've left it too late. Why have you left it too late? Well, Physically, All right? Yeah. yeah, I'd hate to change a tire now. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <clears throat> and to the person out there who who is um, is, is want to, uh, but wanting to be a budding entrepreneur, looking at market, looking at disrupting a market, what's, what sort of advice would you give that person? I don't know if I'm qualified to give advice because I've I've just jumped in when I thought I should. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that in itself is the advice. Well, maybe it should be. But I don't recommend it unless you really want to do it. Yeah, good yeah. point. Yeah. Super yeah. stuff. Because you could make a mistake. And I've made plenty of those anyway, but the, the good times still come. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. It strikes me, though, that you probably learned from a lot of those mistakes and kept on. Well, sometimes I wonder. Really? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. You know, they say you should expect the same results if you keep doing the same things. And I've done it a couple of times like that because I didn't think that result should have been the one it was. But it's turned out to be the right one. Yeah. <laughs> it happened again sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, I can't say that um, I've been through life without making mistakes and not repeating them because I have. Right. Have you broken those patterns? Hmm. Yeah. Super stuff. <laughs> well, Tony, uh, um, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. I've been absolutely um, gripped by this story. Um, particularly just how you've let life unfold in front of you, certainly in those early parts, and and hearing about how you kept moving on despite the fact that you're getting such overwhelming, um, you know, overwhelming resistance and feedback from from the rest of the market. Um, thank you very much for your time, and um, for anybody else out there that's listened to it, um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, there's been lots in there to take away and think on. 
Um, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Tony, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Ben. Cheers. <laughs>